our discussions from weeks six and seven in our class. I wanted to talk a little bit about computer-mediated communication, including email. Uh, email is convenient because when the sender writes it, she, he or she has time, and then when the recipient reads it, it's when he or she has time. So when you send it, you have time to write it. When somebody has time to read it, they read it. Although, it, keeping in mind, if you need an urgent reply, sometimes if you don't have time to wait, you're going to have to use the another form of communication other than email, like maybe picking up the phone and calling, or using Skype or some other method of communication. It does seem like a hindrance to use computer-mediated communication, instant messaging, email, social networks, etc., uh, to contact someone in close proximity to you. I find this particularly frustrating when people text each other while I'm in the same, or excuse me, while they are in the same room. I have seen this happen many times and it just seems awkward to me why they just don't talk to each other. Although I have found it does have particular benefits for my husband and I when we are trying to text each other in the same room so our kids don't hear what we have to say. There is though definitely a chance of people missing the nonverbal cues in computer mediated communication. That's why I decided this semester that I would try this method of communicating and uh, talking to you using this method versus just typing out my messages for you. Hopefully you get more out of seeing me live and in person. When you are using technology consciously, it does allow you to control it, not it to control us. And this is especially when it comes to communication. I did a lot of research on this last semester and it is true that people can spend too much time on Facebook and on online role-playing games, so much so that they become addicted to it. And there are even articles out there about how Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all of those computer-mediated communication methods can actually make you depressed and also be a hindrance to your social interactions versus advancing your social interactions. So you might want to take a look at that if it's something that interests you. I do definitely appreciate all of your thoughts on telecommunicating. I am a telecommunicator. I telecommute to Red Rocks, as if you can't tell, and then I also telecommute to uh, the college where I take classes as a doctoral student. I do find it fun because sometimes I don't have to get up and get ready in the morning. I can just wear my pajamas to work. I do, however, teach on a college campus as well, and so I do have to get up and get dressed and look professional sometimes as well. I find that telecommunicating is sometimes tough because it's hard to get to know people when you are not on campus with them or not at work with them. It does make it a little bit harder for us to get to know each other. I don't get to know my students as well in the online format, and I definitely have a little bit of trouble getting to know my classmates. Although this semester, I have found it a little bit easier to get to know my classmates because we've had to get together for a couple of group projects, and I've been coordinating our meetings via Skype, which is another interesting adventure, but so far, so good. We're getting somewhere with our, our projects and our research. So. Telecommuting is not all bad, but it does require you to put forth some extra effort, especially when you're trying to create relationships with your coworkers. Definitely when you are using computer-mediated communication, use proper grammar, spelling, punctuation, basically all writing mechanics. Even in our in-class discussions, it's important to use the best writing mechanics that you know how to use. If you're using Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, sometimes with those things, you don't use the perfect grammar, spelling, what have you. But you want to use your best writing skills when you are sending emails, posting in class discussions, what have you, because it helps you to maintain your good writing skills versus when you don't do that and your writing skills become even poorer and poorer and then I see student papers that use LOL and other shorthand for texting. Obviously most of us know what LOL means, but it's not appropriate in formal writing. So be careful when you're using, uh, using shorthand. It is important not to label your emails 
at least too many of them as high importance. In fact, I have an instructor who, if you label all of your emails as high importance, he will probably put you at the bottom of his reading list because he figures not everything you send to him can be of high importance. It is also important to use a signature. That way people can contact you back. They know it came from you directly. It's, a, it's just a good idea. Use a signature on your email addresses. Use a signature when you are writing business letters. Even faxes can be helpful if you have a signature. Now the exception, of course, is memos because you don't sign the bottom of a memo. You just put your name at the top. Another thing is about voicemail. There was a girl who was listening to me leave a voicemail the other day and she said, wow, you must do that a lot. And I laughed and I said, yes, I do. I have a lot of practice leaving voicemails. The thing that impressed her most is that I always say my name twice and I always say my phone number twice just in case people didn't catch it the first time, especially with somebody who talks as quickly as I do. I'm a trained auctioneer so I have a tendency to talk pretty fast. Uh, remember that when you're choosing a screen name and an email address, you should choose wisely because people will get their first impressions from you through those choices, whether it's your screen name for Twitter or in Instant Messenger, Skype. You want to make sure that you choose a, a good screen name. Sometimes I choose to use my initials and that's not always the best choice because my initials are H-A-G and HAG sometimes doesn't come across as good. So I try to use my full name whenever possible, especially in email addresses and screen names. Uh, hopefully you learned some good ways to confront your boss if you, are, if you have to do this. There are definitely times when you need to talk to your boss, especially if you're being overworked or underpaid. There are ways to talk to your boss about that. I'll mention a book here in just a couple of minutes that you might want to take a look at if, you're do if you are going to be doing uh, some confrontation with your boss. I thought about me. I work, I, I work a lot. I work almost 24-7. Uh, this is partially by choice and partially because Sometimes students don't understand that just because I have an email address or a phone number doesn't mean that I am sleeping a part of the day. Uh, I don't know. I, it's very crazy in the world of teaching, but students sometimes think that they should have access to us all the time. And so it makes it difficult for me when I can't get back to people right away. But I try to get back to people in a timely fashion. And I would suppose that you all would want to do that too if you are using computer mediated communication. I have been t teaching college classes though for 14, uh, almost 15 years. So I do love what I do and I don't think I would give it up for anything. Uh, moving on a little bit to week seven, we almost all of us understand proxemics and invading personal space. In the U.S. this is a really big deal. We don't want people to be in our personal space. In other cultures, though, it's a societal norm to have people be a little bit closer to you and be in your personal space. So this is definitely something that you want to look into if you are going to another culture or if you're interacting with people of a different culture on a regular basis. Nonverbal communication is actually believed more often than your verbal communication. Depending on which textbook you read, it could be anywhere between 60% of the time that people believe your nonverbal communication to 90% of the time. So it's important to keep your messages ma matched up with the, with the message you are providing verbally and nonverbally. Make sure that you know the cultural and societal norms of nonverbal communication as well. It is essential to workplace success. I know people have had some challenges when using things that we think are okay in the United States, like the thumbs up. It's not always okay in other languages. Uh, and this means peace to us, but it doesn't mean peace to everyone. So again, if you're traveling to another culture, make sure you're aware of those nuances. Uh, it is good to be honest. 
It is hard to teach honesty. I do know that because I am trying to teach my 14-year-old son how to be honest, and I keep telling him if you are caught lying at work even once, it will likely cost you your job, and this is definitely true. So if, you, if at all possible, be honest, and if at all possible, teach honesty. You will find that it's much easier to remember the truth in the end. If you are trying to confront someone at work, like I mentioned earlier, you might want to check out the book called Dealing with People You Can't Stand, How to Bring Out the Best in People at Their Worst. This is written by Drs. Rick Kirchner and Rick Brinkman. You can find it on Amazon. Just Google Dealing with People You Can't Stand or type that in your Amazon search and you should be able to find it. It does provide some truly sound advice for these types of situations when you have to confront someone that it might be tough to work with. It is good to be a powerful communicator, but it is also important not to be a bully with this power. Believe it or not, there are bullies even outside of middle school, so we need to be careful, excuse me, when we are given some power that we don't abuse our power. Listening is just as important as speaking when we are talking about the power of verbal and nonverbal communication. If there's no one listening, then there's no point in anyone speaking because there's no communication, there's no information getting across from one to the next. Practicing will help minimize your communication anxiety, especially when you're get, thinking about the presentation that you need to give for the end of this semester for the class. Work on minimizing your communication anxiety by practicing the presentation before you give it. And if you want more information on reducing anxiety, you could look up cognitive restructuring and or systematic desensitization. If you look those up, you may be very well able to put your therapists or any therapists that you may have to deal with in the future out of business because they do a lot of cognitive restructuring and systematic desensitization. I hope you have learned something from our time together. And of course, if you have any questions, please call or email. I will be available.